have to get that off my chest. Um, but um, he, uh, he just wasn't a very sophisticated person. Um, if he had produced the Book of Mormon, it seems to me it should have collapsed a long time ago. The fact is, though, that from a lot of perspectives, it's looking better than it ever has before. I noticed John Clark sitting in the back there. Um, John has made some really interesting comments about this, about the trajectory of Mesoamerican studies and how the Book of Mormon is looking better than it did decades ago. And this is true in a lot of regards. If it were the shallow product of a shallow fraud, it should have collapsed years ago. It should not be getting better with the passage of time, but it is. And to me, stronger than any particular single secular argument for the Book of Mormon, uh, that's the strongest of all secular arguments, is simply the book shouldn't still be around. But it's getting better. It looks more firmly established, more secure than it ever did before. I mean, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, Hugh Nibley was just beginning to write on the Book of Mormon. There was virtually nothing of any serious academic quality on the Book of Mormon. Since then, you've had not only uh, Brother Nibley's remarkable uh, product, but, um, but farms and the Maxwell Institute, the Willis Center, all these things are now coming about that are creating wonderful opportunities uh, for scholars to write on the Book of Mormon. And there are more scholars than ever before. We may not, we may not be up to Nibley's speed, but there are more of us. Um, and so a lot of work is being done, and, uh, and the Book of Mormon is looking really, really good. And that's a remarkable thing. Now, let me just close with a testimony, and then I'll open it up to questions or objections. Um, the, uh, the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon is an important fact in and of itself. And it's really, really important that it be true. It's really important because of the things it says. Even more important than the Book of Mormon itself is what it points to, which is that it's a second witness for Christ. It's a witness that there is a God, that he does care about us, that he cared enough about us to send his son, who sacrificed himself on our behalf, and who makes it possible for us to return to the presence of our Father in heaven. And that's the most important news that anybody could ever want to hear. It's the most important news or message that anybody could convey to anybody. And so the fact that the Book of Mormon is looking better than it ever has before, I think, is remarkable and really important. And I'm delighted in any way that I can to get that news out. So I bear you my testimony that it is true in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Now, I will take questions. Are there a translation process? Which ones in your mind are the most credible and which ones are the least? There are various, trans uh, various accounts of the translation process. No full accounts. There are you know, bits and pieces in various interviews. I mean, I don't even know how I'd quantify them. There are lots of interviews with David Whitmer. There's even a book, unfortunately out of print, I wish it would come back into print, by uh, uh, Lyndon Cook called simply David Whitmer Interviews that had, if I remember correctly, 87 different interviews with, with David Whitmer by, uh, by Orson Pratt, Joseph F. Smith, by visiting our LDS missionaries, by returning LDS missionaries, by skeptical journalists, all sorts of interviews. And, and, every, and many of those have little bits and pieces. He's the most interviewed witness. And then there are, there are others, uh, Martin Harris, uh, uh, Emma Smith, and others who give little bits and pieces. There's no single account. And you have to piece them together. And you also have to remember that, uh, that sometimes David Whitmer, for example, is speculating about what Joseph Smith saw uh, because he never saw it himself. And I don't know how much Joseph told him. Joseph was asked on occasion to tell about the details of how the translation was done, and he just declined to do it. Uh, so I don't know that he ever really told the full story to anybody, including, including David Whitmer. But, uh, but David was there and observed it. So his... His perception of how the room looked and you know the layout and so on is probably pretty accurate. His perception of exactly what Joseph saw on the plates and so on is is probably speculative to a certain extent. But Whitmer provides the most uh, information on the translation process because Joseph wouldn't talk about it. Yeah. I got the idea that Joseph Smith was looking at the plates, but from what you described, he never looked at the plates. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the really peculiar things about it. I always assumed that too. We have this, we have this picture in our minds. It's based on artwork um, of uh, of Joseph with a curtain in front of him, separating him from the scribe. He's got the plates, and he's sort of reading along with his finger, with furrowed brow, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, that isn't the way it worked, apparently. I don't know of any account that represents it that way. Um, you know, the fact is that just looking at the plates. Joseph couldn't translate them any more than I could translate a page of Chinese. I could look at it all day long. Uh, and I couldn't come up with anything except by some sort of inspiration or revelation. And Joseph did that. Now, I've sometimes wondered why did he have to have the plates if he didn't 
have to look at them to get the translation. I mean, I'm not saying that this was not a translation. It was, but it was done in a different way than any other translation I know of, because it was a translation by revelation. He wasn't doing it like I would, with a text in front of me. I've been doing it today. I do it most days, where I have a text in front of me and a lexicon to my right hand, and you know, I'm following along and trying to figure it out, and so on. That wasn't the way he did it. He didn't know Reformed Egyptian any more than I know Sanskrit. Um, um, but why would the plates be important? I think, for one thing, maybe as reassurance to him. We assume, and I think this is one of the contributions of Richard Bushman's biography of Joseph. Um, Richard shows that Joseph didn't know everything that we thought he knew at the beginning. I mean, he had to grow into this too. And I think at the very beginning, he must have needed reassurance um, and some help. Uh, I've, I've sometimes compared the, uh, the Book of Mormon plates almost to training wheels. Um, and the Urim and Thummim. Later on, he didn't need it. He could get re revelation without it. But it really helped him at the beginning um, to have something tangible, to let him know this is not just you imagining things. Uh, you know, to him too, the plates might have been a testimony. You're not imagining this. There's 60 pounds of metal right there, um, and then it came from somewhere. And you know, you didn't make it. So Nephites made it, just like the story says. Um, and I think that was really important for the foundation of the church, but also for, for Joseph Smith's growing into the role of a prophet. I'm just speculating there, but uh, I, I do know of a similar case. Well, let me tell, you, tell it to you really quickly. Maybe somebody here knows who it was. I remember many, many years ago, before my, uh, before my mission, attending a little gathering, very informal gathering, where a man came who was even then in his 90s, I think, and he was, uh, he'd been ordained a patriarch many years before. This story has stayed with me for a long, long time because I'm, I'm getting really ancient now, and so it's been a long time. Uh, but uh, he said that when he was first ordained a patriarch, he'd never had his own patriarchal blessing. He was terrified. Well, fortunately, he said for several months, nobody asked him for a blessing, so he thought, this is great. I may, I may have a long tenure as patriarch and have the honor of it and never actually have to do anything. Uh, but then, unfortunately, some kid contacted him and wanted a blessing, and so he was scared to death. So what he did was he began researching in the scriptures um, to find out everything he could about patriarchal blessings. There were no manuals or anything. They just ordained him and left him. He was living, if I recall correctly, somewhere off in southeastern Utah or someplace, way away from anything. And, uh, and so he wrote out a patriarchal blessing that he thought would be a really good one to give, and he memorized it. And this is what he was going to give to this boy when he came. Well, he said... When, he, when the boy came and he sat him down, and he put his hands on his head, he suddenly felt impelled to open his eyes. And there on the wall opposite him, and this struck me immediately as being awfully like the Book of Mormon story, on the wall opposite him, he saw a line of letters in, in light on the wall. And, uh, and he read them. And as he read one line, it would disappear and the new line would appear. And he read off an entire patriarchal blessing, utterly unlike the one he'd written out. Uh, now he, he said, did that ever happen again? No. But he said it never needed to happen again. Because I knew now that I wasn't going to be left on my own. I was going to be OK. Uh, and I thought, maybe that's sort of what happened in Joseph's case, that he needed these tangible objects. The Lord could have simply revealed the text to him. Um, and in a way, he did. But he needed to have the objects there, all those things there with him, to help him understand you're not hallucinating. This is not purely subjective. And to make a point to us, too, this isn't purely subjective. People who want to say, oh, yeah, well, Joseph probably really believed it, but it's not true. Well, they've got to explain, where did the 60-pound gold object come from? And the Leahona and the Urim and Thummim and all those sorts of things, which other people saw. Uh, so I think they're really important for that. They put this whole story on a really firm basis so you are not allowed to say, well, Joseph sincerely believed it, but it was all kind of subjective with him. No, it was... If it was anything, it was not that. There was objectively real stuff. Joseph had a whole series of really weird objects at the end of the 1820s in his possession, and then they disappeared. Um, so what do you make of that? Somebody made them. Now, it's either a 19th century fraud, or it's